Hello, my name is Douglas Kishoke. I am a lecturer at Strathmore Law School and a reader in IP and IT law. Our lecture today is about the structure, the municipal structure of copyright law in Kenya. And we will specifically look at the entitlements of copyright law, uh, the, the entitlements of neighboring rights, um, what it means to infringe, and what remedies are available under Kenyan copyright law. Now, what is a copyright? A copyright is a form of intangible property. It is an exclusive right granted by the state to an author, the creator of a work that is original and that is embodied in a fixed form. Copyright entitlements include the right to copy, to distribute and adapt the work. It is worth noting though that copyright does not protect ideas but the expression of ideas. Let us pause a bit to think about the theoretical justifications of copyright law. Broadly, there are four types or four general uh, theoretical justifications of copyright law. The first is a natural rights theory, reward theory, incentive-based theories, and democratic arguments for the granting of copyright law entitlements. Now, natural, natural law rights argue that the rights in copyright recognize that because property rights emanate from the mind of an individual, the fruit of the labor, intellectual labor of an individual, then they should be entitled to property rights in the product of their intellectual labor. Indeed, the argument proceeds that the theft of that type of intangible intellectual property is theft in the same manner as if it were theft of tangible personal property. These arguments, these personalist arguments about the entitlements of copyright called personality theories are especially um, popular in continental Europe and the leading proponents being Kant and Hegel. John Locke, John Locke proposes also the labor theory of property and insists that a person enjoys natural rights in the fruits of his labor in transforming raw materials by combining them with products that are held in common so that they may produce a product that is of enhanced value and that when that happens that individual should be entitled to the fruits of their labor. Now, critics of natural law rights theories challenge the concept of individual creation of ideas given the fact that no intellectual creation, no cultural creation happens in the platform, in a platform. Very often, indeed most times, intellectual creativity, innovation, is happening built on the work of pre-existing work. So that individual claims to new products that include mixing one's own intellectual labor with products in the public domain would be deemed weak. Indeed, the criticism of Lockean labor theory is that it does not self-explain why a resource that is held in common should entitle one to a property, property right in the resource only when they have merely made tweaks to come up with a new product. Reward theories. Generally, reward theories move in this direction that if you want cultural products to be produced, then you have to reward persons engaged in that kind of endeavor. The usual criticism of reward theories as justification for, for property rights in copyright are that most often creative types don't need rewards to be creative. And indeed, they would be engaged in creative activity anyway. Examples of reward schemes that do not involve copyright endowments in literary work 
include, for instance, the cane price, of which uh, there are several Kenyan winners, Binyavanga, Aworo Thiembo, the Pulitzer Prize, the Man Booker Prize. And it is indeed argued that this kind of uh, reward schemes have a low economic cost as opposed to uh, reward schemes based on copyright monopolies. Broadly and thirdly are uh, incentive-based theories. Now, the argument here is that if we don't incentivize creativity, there shall be no creativity. And that you need to give a monopoly to persons engaged in creative endeavor so that they are able to recoup the effort of their work. The argument is usually advanced that the first mover in creative endeavor expends a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of expertise in creating a work which, when it is produced to the public, is easily copied. This is, of course, an argument uh, that is uh, consistent, even for patent law, where companies that engage in research and development make the argument that they require the monopoly that is granted by the state to recoup the costs of research and development um, uh, investments um, at, for innovation. Now, this argument, this reward, uh, this uh, incentive-based theories uh, presuppose that in, in the absence of these incentives, that production would not occur at optimal levels. And the high cost of production would deter, uh, would deter creativity. Therefore, um, the copyright rights are granted to facilitate creativity and to prevent market failure. Finally, <coughs> you have the democratic arguments that um, have found voice through scholars such as Neil Netanel and William Fisher. Broadly, these arguments present that granting copyrights allows you to build a democratic culture of civility, of eruditeness, and of civil debate in society. And that this is the ideal society that um, a copyright helps to produce. <clears throat> now, very well, so we know, what we, we know that copyright is an endowment, an entitlement of property rights in an intangible thing. But to whom? Section two of the Kenyan Copyright Act defines authors as the owners of creative work. Now, if the work is literary, musical or artistic, the person who first makes or creates the work is the author and therefore the owner of the copyright. If it is a photograph, then the person who is responsible for the composition of the photograph is the owner of the copyright. If it is a sound recording, variously called entrepreneurial rights, the person who is responsible for the arrangement and the making of the sound recording then is the owner of the related right or the rights in copyright thereto. If the work is audiovisual, as for instance movies, then the person who, make their, who makes the arrangements when the film is being made is usually pronounced the author. This usually is the director of the production. Now, if it is a broadcast, then the owner of the copyright is the first broadcaster. And if it is a published edition, then it is the first publisher who is the owner of copyright and is therefore the author. If it is a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic quirk or computer program which, which is computer generated, then the individual by whom the necessary arrangements for the creation were undertaken is deemed to be the author. And if it is a computer programmer, who is writing a computer program, then the person who exercised control over the working of the program is deemed to be the author. What is a subject matter of copyright? Right? Section 22 of the Kenyan Copyright Act spells out the, um, the products of creative endeavor that qualify for copyright protection. These include literary work, which is your novels and your poems, and your plays includes musical work, artistic work, audiovisual work, 
sound recordings, broadcasts. Now, Section 22 of the Kenya Copyright Act requires that for, for uh, literary, artistic, and musical works that we have originality as a precursor to copyright protection. Now, what is originality? It's much, it is a much contested uh, uh, principle in copyright law, which we could really break down into two elements. The first is that for anything to be original, it must be independently created by the author. It must also evince a minimum or a modicum of, of creative talent. In some jurisdictions, they say that there must be skill, labor, and judgment that has clearly been applied to the production of the work. These things combined delineate originality. Now, this requirement for originality is not required for entrepreneurial works. This includes sound recordings, films, broadcast, typographical arrangements. This is because the, pro the property rights are neighboring rights, which are something akin or related to copyright. Now, if we examine the individual elements that delineate originality, taking in turn independent creation, the first meaning of this uh, word independent creation would mean that it is an original work that originates from the author. Second, would mean that it is not a copy. Because if we make a copy slavishly of an item that already exists under copyright protection, then the item we produce, however skillful the copy we have made, is not entitled to copyright protection. Copyright will not vest in this item. Now, what is not required to prove originality. It is not a requirement that the work is inventive. At this point, we want to draw a distinction between the requirements of patent law, of novelty or inventiveness, that the technology you seek to protect, to gain a monopoly for, must be new, must be non-obvious, and must involve an inventive step. Such a requirement does not exist uh, to, for originality. It is not a requirement to prove that the work is a novel, and it is not a requirement to prove that the work is uh, unique. The other important concept when, when dealing with copyright law is the much talked about and difficult to place idea expression dichotomy. Now, Article 9.2, Article 9.2 of TRIPS states that in no case does copyright protection for an original work of authorship extend to any idea, procedure, process, system, method of operation, concept, principle, or discovery, regardless of the form in which it is described, explained, illustrated, or embodied in such work. This means, to state a triteness of, con of copyright law, that Copyright protects the expression of ideas and not ideas themselves. Now, two exceptions of this idea expression uh, principle. One is the merger doctrine. Now, in an instance where there is only a limited number of ways that a concept or idea can be expressed, there is little difference between the idea and its expression. And it is therefore said that the two have merged. What this then means is that a limited number of ways of expressing the idea are not entitled to copyright protection because, in essence, that would be protecting the idea. Something outside the scope of copyright law. The merger doctrine means that even if things are substantially similar or even identical, they might not be a copyright infringement. The second aspect that is a uh, departure from idea expression dichotomy is sense affair. In American copyright law, one finds that there are tropes, 
such as scenes, which are very common when addressing a particular topic. Say, for instance, soldiers marching at war. This is a common scene in war movies. Think about uh, movies about slavery in the American South. You know, runaway slaves being chased by dogs, right? Buttering at the market for slaves. Slaves being whipped into submission. Slaves singing hymnals on Sunday, wishing for death. These scenes are sins affair. They're sins affair and they are stock or trope scenes which means that if you include them in your work, you will not be able to claim copyright protection for these trope scenes. The other context in which the idea expression dichotomy uh, uh, comes, comes into purview is with regards to historical work. And with regards to historical work, the author of a historical work finds themselves at a unique disadvantage because once they have put out their work, despite the effort that they expend at it, they find that the facts that they have established may be relied on by another author without that being copyright protection. Because indeed, copyright law does not protect facts, only the expression of ideas or perhaps the expression of those facts. So, some arguments are made that if a historical author raises a critical theory right, in their historical work, then the question is whether the historical theory acquires the, uh, the, the position of fact. And if it does, then even that will not, um, even that will not attract um, copyright protection. Also, uh, with regards to idea expression dichotomy, is recipes, um, and when you think about uh, Swahili dishes and, and, and how stock Swahili dishes can be and how uh, formulaic uh, people who come from one region can end up preparing their own meals, one would find that if they write a recipe book that is only a description of the methods, uh, quantities, uh, and condiments that are required to make a particular dish, that this uh, kind of arrangement of work would not attract copyright protection. However, if particular, if particular um, uh, nuance is put into the work, discussing the embellishments, discussing the tastes, discussing the historical um, uh, relevance of the dish or how the dish came to be, then these particular aspects which are, the, which, which, um, are unique and original, then this will attract copyright protection. Now, let us turn to the entitlements of copyright law. <clears throat> Must begin by saying that broadly we can um, we, can we can divide these entitlements into two. The first being moral rights and the second being economic rights. Now, moral rights broadly exist in four categories. This is the right for the author of a work to be named as such, to have paternity in their work. The right of the work to have integrity, for the work not to be mutilated. The right of the author to have the freedom from false attribution. That is, for work that they have not produced to be attributed to them. And finally, for the right of the author of a work to have privacy. Now, moral rights are not transferable and it is unique, it is a unique feature of countries with uh, Anglo-Saxon systems of law, common law systems of law, to avoid moral rights. Right. Of course, in continental Europe, moral rights, just like the insistence on personhood theories of copyright law, are given preeminence because of the understanding that one finds specific expression um, uh, in, in their work, that, that one's work is a way of expressing oneself. Now, the right to paternity as a moral right is a right to be the named as the author of a literary, musical, or artistic work, or as a director of a film or an audiovisual work. The right to integrity is a right to protect the work from being misquoted, mutilated, disparaged, and attacked in a manner that comprises, that compromises the reputation or honor of the author. False attribution means that I did not produce it and I don't want to be attached to it because, um, because 
being attached to work that I have not produced may incur for me criminal sanction, prosecution and conviction, maybe even defamation. Finally, uh, mor moral rights include the rights of an author of a work to privacy, that the work is not published without their consent. Now, when we think about, when we think about um, the next set of rights, which are economic rights, these are rights that seek to secure the author or the owner's material and to have them draw financial benefit from their productive and creative work. Economic rights in literary, musical, and artistic work include the rights or the entitlements to be able to reproduce your work, to make copies of your work, to issue or authorize translations, to make adaptations and derivative works of the work, to distribute by leasing, by hire, by importation and exportation, to authorize communication to the public, and to authorize broadcast of the work, whether wholly or partially. Copyright law is territorial. That means that every country establishes uh, the reaches, the minimum requirements, the upper reaches of copyright law within its national jurisdiction, within its borders. So very often, when a country sets up its copyright law, it does not have extraterritorial application. So it is with Kenya's copyright law. At section 22.4 of the Kenyan Copyright Act, we find that works that are produced by Kenyan citizens will attract automatic copyright protection. Works that are produced by persons who are domiciled in Kenya or ordinarily resident in Kenya, even though they are not Kenyan citizens, will attract automatic protection by Kenyan copyright law and works that are owned by a body corporate that is incorporated under Kenyan law will attract, will attract uh, copyright protection under Kenyan law. What's the term of copyright duration? What are the standard terms of copyright duration? Now, when we are dealing with a literary, musical or artistic work which has been produced by an individual, then the term of copyright is 50 years plus the life of the individual. That means the term of copyright expires 50 years after the death of the author of a literary, artistic, or musical work. If the work is audiovisual or a photograph, so audiovisual like a movie or a photograph, right, then the term of copyright is 50 years from the making of that audiovisual work. If it is a sound recording, then it is 50 years after the end of the year of recording. And if it is a broadcast, then it is 50 years from the first year in which the work was broadcast. If you have offered works to which we don't know who the authors are, or pseudonymous literary, uh, musical, and artistic works, and pseudonymous are works produced by people who are under pseudonyms, uh, names that are not their own, then the term of copyright expires 50 years after the first date of publication. Our copyright law creates ex exceptions to copyright infringement. These are things that a purchaser of a copyrighted work may lawfully do with an item right, they have purchased but for, for which copyright vests in another. Right? Usually, where one makes use of the work, makes a copy for the purposes of criticism, scientific inquiry, for educational purposes. These are generally deemed to be acceptable fair dealing exceptions to copyright infringement. Now, what constitutes infringement of an individual's or an author's copyright? Uh, infringement, according to Section 35 of the Kenya Copyright Act, occurs when a person without the license of the owner, without the permission of the owner, 
reproduces in material form the original work or its translation. I repeat, reproduces in a material form the original work or its translation. That means they make a copy in a tangible form the original work or its translation. So if the work is in English and I translate it into Swahili, it is infringement. When we say material form, we mean that the copy has to be in a tangible form. The other thing that constitutes infringement is the distribution to the public through sale, through rent, through lease, through hire, through loan, and through importation. Third, it will be infringement to communicate the work to the public, i.e. to perform the work in public without the authorization of the copyright holder. It is also copyright infringement to circumvent technology protection measures that are inbuilt in a work of copyright that are specifically put there to prevent unlawful copying. It is, of course, infringement to engage in the manufacture, importation, sale, lease of devices that are, are primarily meant to infringe or to circumvent technological protection measures. Of course, it is an infringement of copyright to attempt to remove electronic rights management programs that try and prevent unlawful copying. Now, what must a plaintiff prove? What a, must a person who is a copyright holder who wants to sue prove to succeed in a suit for infringement of their reproduction rights? Now, a, a plaintiff must prove that a copy was made. A plaintiff must prove that a copy was made to succeed in a suit of um, a violation of their reproduction right. Now, this may include a mechanical copy, as for instance, dubbing over a CD. This may include reaping a CD. It may also include having a copyrighted work in mind as you write your own work, so that at the end of it, you reproduce scenes or lines that have a striking similarity with a piece of work that is already under copyright protection. The second thing that a plaintiff who needs to succeed or wants to succeed must prove is that the infringing thing is a copy. The thing that infringes is a copy. Third, a plaintiff who must succeed must prove that the amount taken from their copyrighted work is substantial and therefore that there has been improper misappropriation. How does one prove copying as a matter of fact? How does one prove copying? Now, very often it might be possible when you look at the infringing copy, prima facie to make the argument that there is evidence of direct copying. Prima facie evidence of direct copying. Also, the defendant can be shown to have copied if it is clear that there is sufficient similarity between the plaintiff's work and the defendant's work and it is clear that they had an opportunity to access the plaintiff's work. Here, a plaintiff who must succeed will have to demonstrate that it is unlikely that the similarity between the two types of work is because, or is occasioned because, of independent creation. Now, striking similarity between, uh, between unusual aspects of the work is prima facie evidence of copying. However, a defendant may rebut the presumption by arguing that A, they did not have access to the work, and B, that both works may have or will have copied from a work that exists in the public domain. Now, the public domain 
is work that has already fallen out of copyright term protection and is therefore no longer protected by copyright law. Of course, if the work that is copied displays the same errors as the work that it, is, it has copied from, then this creates a strong presumption that the work that is secondary is a copy of the prior work. What remedies are available for infringements or breaches of copyright law? Section 38.4 of the Kenya Copyright Act states that criminal sanction, including fines, including imprisonment for up to 10 years, including forfeiture of the infringing copies and non-custodial sentences are possible. So the first type of egregious remedy possible is criminal sanction, including fines, prison time, non-custodial sentences, and forfeiture of the infringing goods or proceeds therefrom. Then, one may sustain a civil action before civil courts where one may seek injunctions to prohibit further infringement. One may seek Anton Pilar orders to enter the premises of the defendant so that they may gather evidence of infringing copies or infringing activity. One may succeed in a civil action for damages for the loss of market share. And one may succeed or may move in an action, a civil action, where they require the infringer to deliver up all the infringing articles to the owner or for the owner to have the right to seize such articles. Our lecture, in summary, dealt with the municipal structure of copyright law in Kenya. It discussed um, what entitlements uh, accrue to an author who is an author. It discussed um, what, are the, what are the entitlements to an author. It discussed what infringement or what it means to infringe. It also discussed um, how one may prove that infringement has happened. Finally, it discussed the remedies, um, the remedies that one may seek in the court, both criminal and civil and administrative, um, when infringement has happened to their copyright rights.